Welcome to the Friday Casebook, our weekly look at what has happened in the world. Roger, the international news were, I guess, all about China this week. What happened there? China's constantly in the news, isn't it? And so they've replaced the one-child policy, uh, not with a two-child policy, but with a three-child policy. I don't think that means that uh, Chinese families have to have three children all at the same time, but we thought this was such a nice photo, we couldn't resist it. Uh, mm -hmm. Even China has the uh, demographic uh, deficit. And so uh, some people who are not gonna be happy about this change of policy, of course, are Chinese families who had to only have one child, although there were some exceptions to this for different reasons over the years, and it's some time actually since it's been forcibly uh, implemented. Um, you know, I expect quite a lot of families will be taking that certificate that they got for only having one child down off the wall and um, will be rather sad about this. But it's, uh, there's something really rather weird though, isn't there, about, um, the state interfering in family planning. I mean, um, obviously all we're all, it's a very progressive thing to have good childcare and so on, so that families who want to have more children are, feel able to do so. But to, to control the number of people, uh, children that people have, whether it's one, two or three, seems an odd thing to do. Uh, and you also have the, the opposite of that. You have uh, little Victor in uh, Hungary, Viktor Orban, who's uh, trying to encourage Hungarian families to have more children. He's got not a three child policy, he's got a four child policy. If you have four children uh, in, uh, in Hungary, you get a lifetime exemption from income tax. So keen is he to get uh, to turn. Uh, Hungarian women, the, especially ones who are a magazine, who are Hungarian citizens themselves, into sort of baby machines that he's incentivizing it with, <laughs> with, with tax money. And um, I mean, you don't need to uh, try to turn your uh, the female part of your population into a baby machine to deal with the demographic deficit, unless you're Viktor Orban and part of your philosophy in an illiberal democracy. There's a there's a there's a very good alternative to dealing with the demographic deficit. We do have an aging population in, in in Europe. We do need more young people in the population, and the answer is on our doorstep. It's migration. Let more people come to to Europe. And of course, Victor, little Victor, calls this uh, the surrender policy, and he's not going to surrender. He's going to um, pay Hungarian women to produce more babies. They uh, they had a. Um, similar problem to this in Denmark a few years ago and we'll put a video a funny spoof video of this in the chat and um, some research was done in Denmark and apparently 10% of Danish uh, babies uh, at that time were conceived abroad on on short breaks and so they, the, 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 the Danish government was going to pay, pay couples to uh, uh, to go to uh, New York and Paris and so on to see if they could uh, increase the the Danish population that way. But um, I mean, okay, interesting approach. <laughs> very, this is very very silly. Uh, I mean, we 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 need to understand that there is an aging population in Europe, and that's why we need to have a much more open, inclusive approach to migration. What else caught your eye this week? So this is the week after years of planning that uh, Laura Covesi, the Romanian uh, judge, who is the first European public prosecutor, uh, open for business. And she gave a very good press conference a couple of days ago, and we'll put the link to the press conference in the chat. Uh, it's a great moment for Europe. There, uh, we know that there's also a big problem in Europe with organized crime, and financial crime, particularly related to uh, fraudulent use of the EU budget. Uh, so now uh, Laura Covesi heads up a team of, I think, about 140 magistrates across Europe from different jurisdictions within the European Union. That, uh, and there's a number to call if you suspect uh, serious organised crime or, 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 or fraud of this, uh, of this nature. And I think what's particularly interesting about it is that, of course, you do have lots of different jurisdictions in the European Union. And that's why for 20 years, although everybody thought it would be a good idea to have a European Public Prosecutor's Office, we haven't actually had one. 
Um, but over the last two years, they found a way to get cut through all those barriers and get the job done anyway and open for business. I rather hope something similar will happen with plans for a European community association that would allow charities and the not-for-profit sector to operate on a European level. Again, that's been held back for many years because of all the complications of different national systems but if they can do it for the European Public Prosecutor's Office they can do it for the European Community Association too. But congratulations to Laura Covetti, good luck to her and I'm very glad that we do have uh, this uh, uh, start to her mandate and the opening of the new office at a time when let's remember the EU budget has doubled because of the recovery plan, doubled twice as big and that's twice as many opportunities for fraud. So I think Laura Covetti is open for business just in time. Cool. So let's take a look at her. There she is. Who's on the naughty step, Roger? So what we discovered this week, Lena, is that, um, you know, making babies isn't the only thing that Danes have been doing when they've been going abroad. They've also been spying on the Germans. Yes. Um, just have <laughs> <laughs> but the Germans haven't been spying on the Danes, especially when the Danes have been going abroad <laughs> for the aforementioned reasons. And um, it's an extraordinary story. I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. Well, it might be surprised if it was Denmark, but I think it was generally known that the Americans had been trying to um, sort of do what, what, what the British did for many, many years, which is to sort of break up the unity of the European Union. The Brits always thought that they could somehow um, divide the European Union and divide and rule, you know, and the Americans tried this uh, too. Um, and they've been a little bit more successful. The British were spectacularly unsuccessful, as we know, uh, during the Brexit negotiations. But the Americans have been a little bit better at this in the intelligence field. And they managed to persuade the Danes to um, really do something very underhand uh, that they shouldn't be doing because the Danes are supposed to be cooperating with other member states in the European Union, particularly in intelligence matters. But the Americans said, look, don't tell anybody, obviously it's a secret, the secret services, but uh, <laughs> share a few secrets with us, do a bit of spying on the, on the, on the Germans and presumably others as well, not just the Germans. And uh, there, there we are, and starting with Angela Merkel, uh, try and read her mobile phone messages. You might uh, see a photo like that of Angela Merkel and uh, think, I wonder who she's texting. Well, you then need, now you know who to call. You call the Danish Secret Service. They will be able to tell you. And uh, presumably in return, the, the Americans said that they would share a little bit of intelligence with the Danes that they weren't sharing with the European Union. So um, I think this is very embarrassing for the Danish uh, government who have known about uh, the fact that their uh, secret services were what they were up to. I mean, presumably there is uh, some accountability of the secret services in Denmark, like there is everywhere else. Um, I, I don't know whether this was, well, it must have been deliberate. Uh, I don't, doesn't mean to say that it was um, directed by the government or the government uh, asked the secret services to do this, but the Danish government have been aware that the Danish Secret Services were doing this for some time and haven't made it public. And now it's come out, thanks to a report from uh, 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 some uh, German uh, journalists, uh, and there was a very good programme about this on Deutsche Welle. Uh, and uh, yes, I think they go on the naughty step for, um, uh, you know, spying on Angela Merkel behind her back, when um, obviously what they should have been doing is making love, not war. Who is the star of the week in your eyes? Well, uh, we've got a sporting personality as star of the week this week. It's not really uh, something we talk about very much, but I think it's important for all sorts of reasons. And this is Naomi Osaka, the Japanese tennis star, who has refused to uh, do any more pre-match or especially post-match interviews, you know, where you uh, are supposed to win, but you lose, and then you have to answer questions to the press about why you lost. And that's the last thing that you feel like doing when you've just lost an important tennis match, I can imagine. Uh, but nevertheless, it's part of your contract. And of course, they do get paid millions and millions of pounds. And so you might, as a member of the public, as a spectator, think, well, you know, that's part of her job. That's what she gets paid for. And certainly that's what the 
broadcasting companies and the people who stump up the money for the tennis players uh, think. But I think there's another side to this. I think there's a mental health issue. She feels it's very stressful. It's very upsetting for her. It's something that she's been very brave, I think, in acknowledging this vulnerability that she has and the fact that it is damaging to her mental health and owning up about it. And instead of showing some sensitivity to that, They've sort of clamped down hard on her and said, we're going to find you and so on. So she has pulled out of the French Open. And I think that is um, a very powerful statement, a very courageous statement. And um, I think we should be sympathetic to Naomi Osaka because I think she's a little bit of a role model here. And I suspect that there are all kinds of people who feel that they get put under unreasonable pressure at work it has an impact on their mental health and um, we should be encouraged to speak up about that much more and there should be in my view an expectation that employers even in a situation like this where somebody's an international star being paid millions of money it doesn't matter behind it you've got a human being mental health issues are very serious we should take them seriously and i think we should be grateful to naomi osaka for what she's done because I hope it will be helpful to her, it may not be, but I think it's helpful to many, many millions of people around the world who do suffer stress and mental health issues at work, and this should be more of an issue. Very important that you raise this issue. Now I want to know what's coming up. It's a launch of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is the opportunity to have your say as a, a citizen of Europe or even a non-citizen of Europe or somebody even living outside Europe, doesn't matter. Have your say about the future of Europe through the Conference on the Future of Europe. Have the opportunity to have your seat at the table. If you join New Europeans, you sign up and join New Europeans, neweuropeans.net and get in touch with us. If you need the help to access the online platform so that you can make your contribution to the debate about the future of Europe, whether it's about health or whether it's about digitalization, whether it's about the future of work or whether it's about the environment, whatever it is, your idea, your voice counts, make your voice heard and share your idea also with us and we will publicize that and encourage others to support your idea and to make their ideas known and make their contributions too. So get in touch, join New Europeans. The Conference on the Future of Europe is ongoing and uh, that's very much the focus for our work at New Europeans in the next period. Thank you, Roger, and thank you all for watching. See you next week. See you next week. Don't forget to subscribe.